interesting study of teaching that was done internationally in different countries. And they looked, one of the countries they looked at was Japan, which is a very high achieving country for maths. And they compared it to the US. And this was one of their results, that Japanese students spent 44% of their time in this place of struggle, having to invent things um, and really struggle, where students in the US were engaged in that less than 1% of the time. I can certainly concur with that from our visits around schools. Teachers don't generally um, think it's their job to have kids be in this place of struggle, which turns out to be so important. And this is important for us as parents, too. Um, one of the parents I interviewed for the book, her name is Karen Gauthier, and Karen said that when she was a child, her parents would let her give up on things that were hard. And at first, when she was a parent, she did the same thing with her children. But then she read about the importance of struggle, and it changed how she interacted with her, parent, oh, with her children. And she gave me a really lovely example of that. She said that... Um, it was, uh, it was with her son two years ago, and she was driving him to his last baseball game in Little League. And he'd never hit a home run. And as I was driving him there, he said, well, it's my last game. Guess I'm never going to hit a home run. And she said to him, well, what do you believe? Do you believe you can? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, when you get up to that plate, you say, I am, I am, and you fill in the blank. You, know, you can say, I'm strong enough, I'm good enough, I'm going to hit a home run. And Joe, he did, he did. Because as he walked to the plate, I just shouted out, I am. And he looked back at me like, oh, mom, be quiet. And then he got up and he hit that home run, and I was screaming. So I love that example. Um, so I've shared two of the keys already about brain growth and about the power of struggle. Both of these pieces of information lead into the third one, which is, I'm sure everybody here uh, knows about the importance of mindset and what your mind believes, what you believe about what you can do. So, um, although occasionally things pop up in the, I notice in the news saying that mindset has been discredited, we are at a time where there has been decades of evidence that show that when you change your mindset, you change what you believe, it actually changes a lot of things in your life. Um, it reduces aggression, it improves learning, and I wanted to share a few of those key studies with you. So health, I think this is fascinating. Um, these mindset researchers studied 61,000, over 61,000 people over 21 years, and they found that people who thought they were doing more exercise were actually healthier than those who didn't think they were doing as much exercise, even when they did the same amount of exercise. And the negative thinkers were 71% more likely to die in the follow-up period than the positive thinkers. So it's pretty important, uh, the kind of life, life uh, important. So um, other, another interesting study about health, they divided hotel cleaning staff into two groups, and they told one group that the exercise they were doing as part of their work satisfied the Surgeon General's recommendations for an active lifestyle. Didn't say anything to the other group. Behavior in the two groups didn't change, but four weeks later, the group who'd been told that exercise was good were, showed a decrease in weight, blood pressure, body fat, waist to hip ratio, and B BMI. So there's a whole host of studies now that show that small interventions and changes in words change the way we think. And one of my favorites from education is this one. The um, researchers divided students into two groups and they were high school English students. They all wrote an essay for their teachers. They all got diagnostic feedback from their teachers, which is the best kind. But for half the students, they added a sentence at the end of the teacher feedback. The kids who got that sentence achieved at significantly high levels a whole year later. So what was that sentence, you're probably wondering. The message that went on the end of the feedback for half the students was this. I am giving you this feedback because I believe in you. And the kids who read that did significantly better a year later. It's pretty amazing. I shared this with a group of teachers recently, and one of them put their hand up and said, um, 
I, you know, I said to them, this doesn't mean you put at the end of every piece of feedback, I'm giving you this feedback so I believe in you. One of them said, so we don't put it on a stamp? I said, no. <laughs> they put it on a stamp. But, um, uh, but what it shows us is how important teachers' words are and how much kids are sitting there thinking, what does my teacher think of me? Does my teacher believe in me? Does my teacher think I can do well? So a couple of other studies that I think are pretty interesting. It turns out that people with a fixed mindset are more likely to be aggressive. And they are more aggressive because they think they themselves cannot change. When they learn that people can grow and change, that takes away this aggression. And when we give mindset interventions to people, they have less desire to be aggressive because they start to realize that others can change, that they themselves can change. So I think this is pretty important for us, particularly in our current times, um, that mindset can be really quite profound in people's lives. And then the last study is a study of school students. 68% of kids who go into high schools experience a drop in grades and become stressed. But it's only kids with a fixed mindset who experience greater stress because of that. Kids with a growth mindset uh, see this as a temporary setback, but you know, this makes sense. If you have a fixed mindset and you're uh, given negative feedback, that's just more information for you that there's, you're not as good. So here's my favorite uh, research study that is so incredible. These are voltage maps of people's brains when they make a mistake. And you can't see it so clearly down here, but what they show is when people make a mistake, there's incredible brain activity. But when people with a growth mindset make a mistake, there is more brain activity than people with a fixed mindset. So this is some very firm evidence that what we believe about ourselves actually changes how our brains work. And I think what this evidence should help us all with is anybody who's in a challenging situation, not just kids in schools, but I'm sure many people here are in challenging jobs. Um, I think what this tells us is if you go into a hard situation and you think to yourself, you know, I've got this, I can do it, but then you mess up or you make a mistake, your brain will be more active than if you go into that situation thinking, I don't think I can do this. So self-belief, it turns out, will change how your brain works. And it, makes, it helps us make sense of evidence like this. These are kids going through seventh and eighth grade. This bottom line is kids with a fixed mindset. This upward line is kids with a growth mindset. And how does this come about? Well, now we know that every time, if you have a growth mindset, every time you make a mistake, your brain will grow more than if you have a fixed mindset. So that helps us understand this pretty impressive, uh, amazing data. So, um, for parents, good news, anybody can change their mindset at any time. And we find that sharing the brain evidence and sharing the, the things that are in my book is actually really a, the, the first path onto getting that growth mindset. We also know that fixed words can be very damaging. When we praise kids for being smart, which most parents do, what we know is, at first, kids think, oh, good, I'm smart. But then later, when they mess up on something, they think, hmm, I'm not so smart. So in my book, I share a lot of ways of praising kids that don't include those fixed words. So instead of, you know, you're so smart, we can say to people, you know, it's fantastic that you learned that. I love your solution. I love, you know, the work you've done on that. I shared this. I was teaching 100 undergrads last month at Stanford, and it was a calculus class, but I shared this mindset evidence with them, and I loved it when I shared the damage of the smart word, one of the undergrads said to me, okay, we're not going to call each other smart, because Stanford undergrads like to use the smart word. It's kind of challenging for them to think it's not a good word, because they've grown up on people, everybody telling them they're smart. But anyway, one of them said, okay, we won't call each other smart. Is it okay if we call each other magical? <laughs> I said, yes, we can call each other magical. But, um, it's very important to give up on labels. You know, we, ideas of being smart, gifted, having a particular ability turn out to be quite damaging. They lead to fixed mindsets, 
They're really based on old ideas of potential. They are what keeps girls and women out of STEM. It's girls with a fixed mindset who don't go forward in those subjects. And part of the reason they're so damaging, oh, the bottom of the slide's gone, is um, if you're somebody who's been praised for having a great brain, every time you struggle, that struggle is really devastating. So I wanted to share with you one of my students at Stanford who was in the teacher program last year, who said to me, when I was describing this, she said to me, oh my gosh, she said, you're describing my life. She said, I grew up, I was in a gifted program, everybody told me I was really good at maths, I had a maths brain, and I enrolled as a maths major at UCLA. But in the second year of the program, I really struggled with one of the courses, so I decided I don't have a maths brain, and I dropped out <laughs> of my maths major. So that is the problem of that fixed ability thinking, and not only is it damaging, but it turns out to be gendered and racialized, and there's some pretty compelling data on that. Um, this was a study where they looked at what, how much professors believed that you had to have a gift to be successful. And this was published in the Premier Journal. And this is why. They found that the more any field believed that you needed a gift to be successful, the fewer women and the fewer students of color were in that field. And these are the graphs of their results. Um, the top graph is STEM subjects, the lower is humanities, the x-axis tells you how much professors believed you need a gift, and the y-axis shows you the proportion of women in the field. So you might notice straight away that maths is right out there on the STEM graphs, more maths professors believe you need a gift to be successful. I'm very interested by this one. Turns out philosophy professors <laughs> believe you need to be born with a philosophy brain to be successful in philosophy. I love that the educators are at the other end of this graph. And if you look at the STEM graph, you'll see the neuroscientists are at the other end of the graph. They know there's no such thing as a gift, so they don't believe in it. But the population as a whole has very firm ideas about this. Guess, um, guess for me now, what do you think is the most commonly Googled word that comes after, is my two-year-old son? Gifted is the right answer. And that is Googled, oh, you can't see it on the screen, two and a half as many times as is my daughter gifted. So we start to see how these ideas are actually pretty um, insidious in lots of ways. And my question is, why do we need this dichotomous thinking of people who are gifted or not or smart or not? Everybody's on a growth journey. There is no cutoff when somebody becomes gifted and somebody's not. Um, so changing our mindsets is a really important thing to do. And it is a journey. It's not a quick switch that you can do. I feel like the bottom of my slides aren't on there. Um, and the good news is that once people start to read the evidence that we share and others share, they start to make that change. Their minds start to change in the way they think about themselves and others. And the first step as a parent or a teacher, who in here is a teacher? Could I see a show of hands? The first step, uh, or a leader, anybody who's working with others, is having a growth mindset yourself. It's very different, difficult to teach people to have a growth mindset if you don't believe that you can do anything. And I really like the work of Anders Ericsson, a Swedish psychologist who's shown that really there are no limits to what people can do. Self-doubt is a natural part of life, but there are, when they look for actual limits of what people can do, they, they don't find any. So Carol Dweck, as you probably know, is the mindset guru. And she's lately changed her mind a little bit about mindset. I was sitting with Carol, here's a picture of me and Carol, sitting, chatting to some Australians last year. And she talked about how she shifted her thinking about mindset. She used to think that we either have a growth or a fixed mindset. But now she's realized that everybody has fixed mindset times. And you can get triggered into these fixed ideas. And it's important to identify your triggers. She also likes people to name their fixed mindsets. So she talked about in that meeting how she was presenting to a large business, and one of the business leaders said he'd named his fixed mindset Dwayne. 
And he said, you know, when we're really under pressure, I become Dwayne, and I get really bossy and critical. And when he said that, one of the young women in the company said, yes, and when you become Dwayne, my Iana comes rushing out, and I become stressed and submissive. So, <clears throat> for parents, my advice, it really is to use growth words and uh, talking growth ways to kids. If they tell you they can't do something, rephrasing it for them and saying, you mean you haven't learned it yet, actually turns out to be quite important, even though it seems quite simple change. Um, don't let your kids give up on things. It turns out when you let them give up on things, they interpret that as you not really believing in them. And, of course, we have to think about that terrible, I deal with this with my two daughters, social comparison, comparison between siblings. It can be really devastating if siblings see another sibling being better than them. And it's really important to turn that around. So if a sibling is thinking, you know, uh, they can do something and I can't, I'm not as good as them, it's really important to change that to they can do it, that means you can do it too. Um, I liked when I was talking about this with my undergrads, one of my undergrads in her reflection to us, because there's a lot of social comparison that goes on at Stanford, uh, wrote down that social comparison is the thief of joy. I thought that was a good statement. But also for parents, I think it's really important to model for them a mindset of discovery. Um, where you don't have to be the expert in the room, you don't, certainly don't have to pretend you know things that you don't. And always model being curious with your kids and maybe having them teach you things. And um, I, When I'm with my students at Stanford, we work on these big exploratory problems and they take them to all sorts of places I've never seen before and I tell them, gosh, I've never seen that before, that's really cool, I'd love to learn more about that. So we know that fixed ideas are damaging in all sorts of ways, and one of them is that it leads to learners being anxious. So the latest research we have on, on learning anxiety uh, comes from the neuroscience labs at Stanford, Vinod Minan has shown that when people have maths anxiety, see numbers, a fear center lights up in the brain. And it's the same fear center that lights up when we see snakes and spiders. And when that fear center lights up, the problem-solving centers of the brain shut down. So it turns out to be pretty important that we're not putting kids into situations where their anxiety is up. Unfortunately, that happens a lot. But um, also interesting data for parents, in a study of six to eight-year-olds, they found that the amount of maths anxiety parents had predicted how well their kids did in maths. But only if they helped with homework. <laughs> That's kind of good news, I think. Um, um, I think you can sort of see how that works. If you're someone with maths anxiety, but you never interact with your kids around maths, then maybe you don't pass it on. But if you're working with them with homework and saying, oh, I was terrible at maths at school, that immediately, those messages start to impact kids. So the three things I've shared before, uh, shared already, Having a growth mindset and knowing about brain change and struggle actually can really change people. It causes people to interact people differently, it causes them to go through life differently. And I think if you live just a single day with this different perspective, you'll feel it. Particularly if things go wrong, it changes those moments pretty significantly. But for learners, this is not enough. The messages we give them are not enough. And the fourth key I talk about in the book is the importance of approaching content really differently. So um, when we approach content with a flexible or multiple sort of lens and see things in different ways, uh, it, that turns out to be really important. Again, from the neuroscience labs at Stanford, they have found that even when you do just a calculation, there are five different pathways in the brain that light up. And two of them are visual pathways. So actually thinking visually about maths is really important. You want to think visually about maths to help stimulate those, part, those brain regions. And the great thing about maths is that, and this is true of other subjects of course, but all the different ways we can think about it is numbers, words, we can model or we use algorithms or move or, or um, 
make graphs. And when we interact with content in these different ways, that's what causes brain communication to happen. So we know that the most powerful brains are actually the most connected brains. When they study super high achieving people, they find there's more brain connectivity happening. So having kids experience content in different ways turns out to be really important. And I know that right now in education, a lot of people have jumped on the mindset bus, or bandwagon, whatever you wanted to call it. But unfortunately, when those mindset messages hit the fixed wall of content, content being really fixed, they fall flat. Because kids can't see how to grow and learn. If you teach maths, for example, as a subject with one answer and one method, Kids can't see that path of growth, and those mindset messages don't mean anything to them. So we really want kids thinking creatively, thinking flexibly, we want to value different approaches. And I thought I'd try a little um, experiment with you now by giving you a maths problem to think about. I'm not going to call, call on anyone, so I hope there's no anxiety um, <laughs> creeping in. But with this maths problem, I would like you to, first of all, think on your own. And then when you have a method or a solution, talk to the people around you, see what they did. So it's a pretty uh, standard maths question I'm going to ask you. And uh, think on your own about this first. And the question is this, what is 18 times 5? When you think you have a, a way of thinking about this, or a solution, maybe you could chat with the people around you, see how they worked out the question. take off those two fives. Or you might think, I'm going to work out 10 times 5 and 8 times 5 and add those two together. Some people work out 9 times 5s and add those together. My personal favorite, uh, some people realize that 18 times 5 is actually the same as 9 times 10. And that visual shows you why those are the same. You can see the area. And some people work out 18, 18 times twos. So when we think like this, this is flexible, um, sorry that's dropped off, it's flexible creative thinking with maths. And when they've studied students who are, they've asked teachers to nominate kids as high or low achieving, what separated students is not how much they knew, but the high achievers interact engage with numbers flexibly, and low-achieving students don't. So it turns out to be really important to get your kids to engage with numbers flexibly. Ask them, ask them to, ask them to work out 18 times 5. See if they use an algorithm or whether they can think in different ways. And 
keep asking them, what different ways do you have to do this? And showing them visually, of course, um, helps those brain connections that we want kids to have. But I've found that when I've shared this with a number of different adults, it's really been quite interesting um, that I've shared all the different flexible ways you can engage with content, and adults, a number of adults have said to me, well, it's not as, I, I sort of, I knew you could do that, but I somehow thought it wasn't allowed. <laughs> and so I think of this as a kind of <laughs> prison. Um, and I asked myself, like, what have we done in our system where people think that this really important part of number work is somehow not allowed? Well, one of the things we've done in our system is this. I'm sure everybody did these in school. And they are the beginning of maths anxiety and the idea that you can't be flexible with maths. You just have to memorize these particular ways. So I can share with you that this, the, the 12 by 12 multiplication table, for many kids, is what I think of as an instrument of torture. <laughs> when they're made to memorize it. Um, but actually, it is also a very interesting playground of patterns, and we could spend some time with these number patterns and really understand number and number relations. And I wanted to share with you a little event that happened on Twitter. It was kind of interesting recently. Uh, we were working with this, we were looking at patterns, and as many people do, we saw vertical and horizontal patterns and diagonal patterns, but then I noticed this interesting pattern. So I was connecting the 12s on the multiplication table, and I noticed these really interesting curves. It curves on the multiplication table. It's kind of shocking. And I took a little picture, and I put it on Twitter, and I said, what's going on here? We have curves on the multiplication table. And um, it was really interesting. So lots of teachers jumped in. Teachers started saying, oh, my kids did a workshop on this today. For parents, it was great. And other people were saying, oh, my gosh, there's a line of symmetry through that table. And I've never seen that before. And um, then the mathematicians jumped in. And they started discussing the hyperbolic nature of the curves. <laughs> the, the, the curves are diminishing and for various reasons. But my favorite mathematician contribution came from a mathematician in Edinburgh. His name's Chris Sanguin, and he said, he saw my little visual and he felt inspired, so he made this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on our website, we always share what we call low floor high ceiling tasks. Uh, anybody can access them, but they go to really high levels. And this struck us as a particularly interesting low floor, high ceiling activity where little kids were getting excited and then the mathematicians were too. So, um, turns out neuroscientists know that maths facts are important, but they also know that when you just blindly memorize things, it's a very inadequate memory. And the really strong memories come from rich, connected, uh, connections where the brain can access different ways of thinking about things. And of course you can make content creative and multidimensional in any subject and in any part of maths. One of my favorite examples to think about is algebra. Um, kids in schools are given patterns like this and they're asked how many would there be in the hundredth case or the nth case and they're encouraged to draw tables of numbers. And then they're encouraged to stare at the tables and numbers until they notice the relationship. So in this case, if you stare at this table of numbers, you might see that if you add one to the case number and square the number, you end up with the total number of squares, which is why we have this n plus 1 squared. But you, instead of that, you can ask people how they see the growth of this pattern. And to describe it algebraically, kids have these amazing rich conversations. You can actually see, I don't know why it's moving, but anyway, just to make it more complicated. You can actually see why it's n plus 1 squared when you visualize it, because it's always a square that's one more than the case number. So um, we, if you want to see more of our creative visual maths tasks, our website at Stanford, has been very popular, we only started a few years ago. And the tasks are used in about half of US schools now. So lots of them there for you to look at. But um, 
I wanted to share with you that in 2016, a remarkable event happened. A previously unsolved problem in the history of mathematics was solved. And it's called the cutting cake problem. But what was really interesting about this was it was solved by two young computer scientists. Mathematicians were getting ready to try and prove that no one could ever solve this problem when these two young CS people solved it. And a lot of people talked about the audacity of this event. How could these people who didn't have the maths knowledge solve this previously unsolved problem in the history of maths? And the two people themselves talked about, well, we were able to think differently. We weren't hampered by all the knowledge that people were approaching this with, and we could think a little bit differently. And sometimes that flexibility in thinking is more important than banks of knowledge, particularly when it's knowledge you can look up online. So um, the fifth key that I want to share with you is this fle how flexibility and depth is more important than speed, which is valued in our school system. This is a great book written by a physicist, and he talks about there's two really different forms of thinking in the world. There's kind of algorithmic, rational thinking, very important, very much valued by the Western world. Uh, but it's really a low-level God. And this other kind of thinking, flexible, creative thinking, is he describes it as the Zeus of human thought. But here's something else interesting about that. The algorithmic, rational thinking, of course, can be performed by computers better than anyone sitting in this room, and faster. But they are at ground zero at getting computers to engage in this creative, flexible thinking. Because the human brain is ideally set up for that kind of thinking. But unfortunately, this is what we train kids to do in schools. And this is really what we want to be training kids to be doing in schools. So we know that speed, as it happens, is the enemy of deep and flexible thinking. When you encourage people to work quickly on something, that creative uh, side of the brain shuts down. So um, we can you can take any content and see it differently. It doesn't have to be maths. Anything. We can encourage people to approach it in different ways and value different pathways. So I wanted to share with you at this point a really interesting, well, I thought it was interesting, <laughs> thing that happened with some teachers in the Central Valley. I was approached by the county leaders in the Central Valley and asked if all the fifth grade teachers, where only 8% of kids were proficient in maths, could take the online class we have at Stanford. And they did this great thing where they got teachers together, they took the course, they um, tried out ideas in their classroom, they came back together. And we studied it in different ways. And the findings were pretty amazing. In the same year that teachers were taking the course, their kids started achieving differently. And one of the key things was the teachers themselves learned that they could do maths. They had been harboring really negative ideas about themselves. They changed those, and then they changed what they did with kids. And one of the quotes from teachers who went through this study was this. The kids were thrilled, going, oh my gosh. He's doing it like that. It's okay that we struggle. It's okay that we think differently. And when I hear that kids are saying things like that, I think, oh my gosh, they didn't think it was okay to struggle. And they didn't think it was okay to think differently. So you can see why kids are not achieving well when they have those really damaging ideas. So the teachers changed, and one of the ways they changed was they started to approach maths with this lens of multiplicity. And three of the teachers, or two teachers and an administrator, are here tonight. So, do you want to stand up, you three? Mm -hmm. Say thank you, thank you. They really thought about great changes for their kids, and if you want to talk to them afterwards, uh, they're here. But one of the things this work makes me realize is that you know, there's been a lot of attention to the mindset how we must appreciate the ways people grow and their minds can change. But equally important is for kids is to appreciate the multiple ways people can think. And that's really an appreciation of difference. And difference and growth uh, go together very well. And when both of those are in place, 
they amplify each other in really important ways. So the final thing I want to share with you is um, the importance of connections between people. We know that when you connect uh, over an idea in maths or otherwise, it requires and develops a deeper level of understanding. And when we interviewed the 62 adults for this book, what we realized was they started to interact with people differently. And a big part of that was that they, they had embraced the idea that they didn't have to be experts, that they could go into meetings and say, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I'm going to find out. And they had also taken an approach of multiplicity, which meant that if anyone put barriers in their path, they found a way around them, which was really important. So my advice for parents and leaders is that sharing uncertainty can be really liberating for people. When you're vulnerable, you can go to meetings and say, you know, I don't know. Um, and with your own kids, discussing ideas with them, not as an expert, as I said earlier, but as a thought partner and as someone who's willing to say, I don't know the answer for that, but I'm going to find out. That's a mindset that's really important to model for them. For the teachers in the room, there are ways of having kids interact well that I won't go into tonight, but are in the book. But I, we know that when people interact and when kids get these different ideas, it's really a big, quite profound change for them. They start to appreciate difference, they start to appreciate the diverse ways people think, and they become more open-minded, and you know, we really need this at the moment. Um, it helps their learning, but it helps everybody when kids become more open-minded in these ways. And I think social uh, humanities and social studies have valued the different ways people think and have discussions about those. But we need it in STEM. It turns out to be a really valuable aid for STEM. So a couple of last comments. How is this different from grit? You've probably heard about grit. There's a lot of attention to grit these days in schools. Well, I see grit, the idea of grit, as a very individual focus, and it's also not helpful for everybody. You, I mean, we can look at world-class athletes and think they've had to be really gritty to get there. But for kids in schools, it, it, grit involves a focus on one thing and letting other things go, and we don't know, and they don't know, what they're going to really want to do. Um, so I don't think it's that good to be that focus, that polar focus at that age. But the other thing about grittiness or limitlessness, being limitless is kind of a freedom of mind and body in a way of approaching things creatively. And I think, you know, being limitless could help you be gritty. I don't think being gritty necessarily leads to this openness. So I want to just share somebody before we uh, wrap up, who's a really interesting young man. His name's Henry Fraser. And uh, he just completed his penultimate year of high school in England. Uh, was an avid rugby player when he had a terrible accident. He dove into the sea in Portugal and he crushed his spinal cord. And he's currently paralyzed from the neck down. So you can imagine such an accident would really change your mindset and your mind about what you can do. But he's such an amazing example of somebody who shifted in his days of recovery, he really went through a shift in his mindset. So now, he's an award-winning writer. His book, The Little Big Things, is great, and the forward by J.K. Rowling. He's a painter, he paints with his mouth, award-winning painter. But he talks about how he's often asked, when he's presented to crowds, people say to him, um, what do you do on the days when you feel down and people are, you know, and you must think to yourself, why me? Why did this happen to me? And this is his response that I wanted you to hear. He says, I look at whoever asks the question and I tell them I wake up every day grateful for everything I have in my life. I get to wake up and do a job I love. I get to be challenged to push myself in many ways, in many levels. And I'm always learning, always moving forwards. Not many people can say that. And when I look at my life this way, I consider myself very lucky. What do I have to be down about? I have much to be happy for. There's no point in dwelling on what might or could have been. The past has happened. It can't be changed. It can only be accepted. Life is much simpler and much happier when you always look at what you can do, not what you can't. And every day is a good day. 
So I love the lens of a scholar called Etienne Wenger. He's a Swiss scholar. Because he talks about how when we learn new things, like the things I'm sharing, um, it changes how we interact in the world. It changes our identity as people. It's not just about learning facts and information. So I have two final things I want to share with you. Uh, these are words from the book, but I wanted to share that we shouldn't ever accept a life that's limited in any ways. And instead of looking back at things, it's much better to look forward, to be positive about opportunities for learning and improvement, and to see others as collaborators with whom you can grow and learn and be open to different ways of thinking. If you're an educator or a parent or a manager, um, value multiple ways that people think and see and work. The most beautiful part of problem solving for me is this multi-dimensionality, the multiple ways the problems can be solved. And that is the diversity of life that's so important to embrace and value, whether it's in maths, history, management, sport, or anything else. So the final words I have, really, is there's probably nothing more important for our own or for our children's or our learners' lives than knowing that you can always reach for the stars. Sometimes you won't succeed, that's okay. But we'll always be helped by setting out on that journey, particularly if the perspective you take is limitless. Thank you. Dr. Bowler has agreed to answer a few questions before we move into book signing. We do want to let you know that Books Inc. is here with the Hot Off the Press's book. Just as a reminder, this is one of her primary book kickoff events, and she shared her evening with us, which is really special. And you can pick up that book tonight before you go, and she will sign it. But before we move to that, are there any questions? She's not going to be answering individual questions right after this talk, so now is your chance to get your questions in. Yes? Exactly that. They say that educators for years, especially special educators, have worked to emphasize kids' strengths. And what they do at the school is they work out what people are weak at and they target those weaknesses and they develop. People develop in all these incredible ways. So I think the business analogy is a great one too. I don't think we should necessarily pick what people think are their strengths. I mean, that's the other question. Is it really your strength? Or have you not developed something because somebody gave you the idea that you couldn't? Or you got the idea somehow that you couldn't? So um, I would challenge that idea that it's all about working with strengths. So um, given the competitiveness of the Bay Area and the fact that what the kids are measured on are not necessarily the things that yeah. um, are <coughs> giving them that growth and right. limitless mindset. Mm -hmm. What is your suggestion to parents who want to, um, you know, mm -hmm. drive in that area, but the reality yeah. is that they're going to be uh, competing against other kids in a yeah. completely different zone? So, well, there's good news on that. <laughs> And the, the good news is that when we teach our kids to be creative and flexible and have a growth perspective and to embrace their struggles, they do better on standardized tests. They do better on narrow forms of measurement that we have in our schools. I mentioned we ran a summer camp a couple of years ago. We had kids for 18 lessons, and we changed them in these ways. We changed their focus, their beliefs, and they took standardized tests at the end, and their improvement was phenomenal. They were 2.8 years of improvement after 18 lessons. So it's a, none of this, although it isn't what schools really focus on, um, all of it will help kids and help kids do well on the things that 
schools are focusing on. Hi. Um, I'm sort of paying to ask this question because it's about intelligence and okay. it seems such a downer in such an uplifting talk. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask the question until your comments about the uh, two questions ago that you question whether people should focus on yeah. their strengths. Mm -hmm. So there's been so many studies about uh, the education attainment that's based on genetics yeah. and intelligence. Yeah. Some of the famous studies are twin studies over thousands and yeah. thousands mm -hmm. of years, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're aware of. Yeah. They took kids who were adopted um, and they found that up to the age of six, their performance in things like math and learning mm -hmm. was very correlated with their adopted parents. But by the age of 12, that correlation had waned away mm -hmm. and was completely gone. It was entirely correlated by the age of 12 with their biological parents. Mm -hmm. Very strong dogs mm -hmm. thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of families. So this idea that one should focus mm -hmm. on one's weak, yeah. weak weaknesses versus focus on the things that one naturally has an aptitude mm. and an intelligence for mm -hmm. seems problematic to me. Where does intelligence and aptitude play a role in your Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I would say that the most recent and studies on genetics and the brain, and we have people at Stanford who are doing some of that most recent and important and cutting-edge work, are actually showing that the impact of what you're born with is a lot less than what those original studies were suggesting. Now, of course, everybody's born with different brains, nobody's born with the same brain, but what is very clear is whatever you're born with is eclipsed by the millions of opportunities you have to change your brain. So, um, I don't know how those older studies would match up to some of this newer work, but, I mean, it's pretty clear when you look at people, and we have so many cases of this now, like um, Nicholas, who people thought, you know, had the very, very weak brain and on every measure that came out, but they targeted it. He and his mother, or his mother when he was very young, decided they were going to build up his brain, and that's exactly what they did. So, um, <coughs> hard to dispute what the last decade has shown, really, about the incredible potential of people to, to change their brains. <coughs> yes? I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a question about the sort of institutionalized like, time limits. That yeah. like this, okay, um, there's this like institutionalized pressure, right, that I have to catch them up or teach mm. this whole entire textbook in this 12-week term. Mm. Um, and from a math education background, I, it grates on me, right, that we should just like we try to teach these algorithms so we can zoom through eight chapters. Um, I love this other stuff, right, like how do you, how do you work with those time limits? Yeah. It's hard for teachers, particularly if teachers are given content standards that are overpacked, and most teachers have that. The current curriculum standards that teachers are dealing with are way too full of antiquated content. And if we could take out the antiquated content, they would actually have a lot more time to go into depth and develop this really good thinking. So I know teachers are really um, stuck with that system they're in, and we have to change that system, it's really important. So I would love to look at the content you're teaching those adults, work out which do they actually really need for their lives, and go into that content in depth. And we find that people are much more successful when that happens. Um, yeah, it's all of us, probably our kids are in classrooms where they're racing through stuff at a very shallow level. And that's part of what we need to change. We need to change it um, at state levels. I actually have just agreed to be on the new California maths framework to try and change some of this. Um, awesome. <laughs> I want to um, I want to make sure that we have enough time tonight to for you to purchase a book and for you to get it signed. And a great way to maybe ask your quick question is to uh, grab a book and uh, ask Dr. Bowler to sign it. Um, uh, if you did bring children, please take them home with you and send them out.
Um, uh, uh, I'm going to ask Vidya. Um, uh, I want to also give a huge shout out to Vidya and uh, Krista, who are our volunteer coordinators. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Vidya to take Dr. Buller straight to the signature table. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Don't forget October 2nd, 8th grade. Uh, bring your kids if they can uh, be good audience members. Stop the recording. <laughs>